So today let's talk about psychopharmacology. As you can see, I have combined this with other topics such as electroconvulsive therapy and psychotherapies. And together we can call this the biopsychosocial management of psychiatric conditions. I've done this so that we can combine all these topics under one lecture. But psychopharmacology and ECT are particularly important from your point of view. So let's move on to this uh, next slide which shows the management of psychiatric uh, disorders. Management in any subject is divided, as you probably know, into investigations and treatment. In psychiatry, we consider these under biological, psychological and social dimensions. In fact, you can even add a fourth one uh, and call it the spiritual aspects of uh, management, which I've included in the end of the table. Biological investigations would include things such as blood tests, such as liver function tests or thyroid function tests. Radiological workup, which may include imaging of the brain. Cardiac workup, uh, especially ECG is very important if you are planning to start somebody on uh, psychotropics, especially antipsychotics. Urine screen may be required to rule out the possibility of drug abuse. Psychological investigations uh, are usually carried out by trained psychologists and may include things such as IQ assessments, which are usually done in the child and adolescent age group. Cognitive assessments may be needed in the elderly population to rule out or confirm cognitive impairments such as dementia. Personality assessments are required in the adult age group to rule out or confirm the presence of personality disorders. Please also remember that uh, in psychiatry almost every condition has a rating scale. These can be used as baseline uh, reading just before you start the treatment. They are diagnostic aids and are not diagnostic by themselves. You can use them to quantify the severity of the condition before your treatment. While the treatment is going on, you can repeat them to note if the condition has improved or not. Social investigations may include uh, inputs from social workers and occupational therapists who will be able to assess the person's social skills whether the housing placement is appropriate and the possibility of any vocational placements. Biological treatments are all the psychotropic drugs which we'll be talking about. And also don't forget that electroconvulsive therapy is also a biological uh, treatment because it involves the use of uh, medications such as anesthetics, muscle relaxants and the passage of uh, mild electric uh, current Psychological treatment may be carried out by trained clinical psychologists, cognitive behavior therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, relaxation therapy, which may include progressive muscle relaxation, family therapies, and a host of other kind of uh, therapies are included under this, and we'll be talking about them a little bit later. Social treatment may include uh, giving psychoeducation to the family of the patient because they will not be aware of the nature of the condition its treatment and the prognosis. If a mentally ill person has a child, then child care uh, issues become very important. Social workers may have to look into that. Other therapists may have to look at financial and uh, housing aspects. As I've said before, spirituality is uh, very important in managing certain uh, milder conditions such as anxiety, depression, or personality issues. Let's move on now to the other basic psychopharmacological issues such as pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics, as you probably know, is what uh, the body does to the drug. That is the body's effect on the drug. Under this, we have to talk about bioavailability, which is basically how much of the given drug reaches the end target. Usually the end target in uh, psychiatry is the brain. So how much of a given psychotropic agent reaches the uh, neurotransmitters in the brain? So that, that would be bioavailability. And it, uh, as you can see, it depends on three factors. One is absorption, which is uh, nothing but the way the drug is absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract if given orally or through the blood vessels if given parenterally. Absorption again uh, depends on the route of administration and the type of drug that is being given. Uh, liquid formulations may have to be 
uh, given in younger uh, patients and uh, that may result in a faster absorption. There are other oil mixed uh, antipsychotic medications which are called depot antipsychotic medications given parenterally, usually intramuscularly. And uh, these are absorbed very, very slowly because they are depot preparations uh, which are absorbed over a long period of time. The next factor which determines bioavailability of a drug is uh, distribution. That is how well the drug is distributed to all the organs of the body, ex especially the target organ. So uh, the, because the target organ is mostly the brain in psychiatry, the blood-brain barrier is of huge consequence as far as distribution into the brain is concerned. And generally lipid soluble substances cross the blood-brain barrier much more easily. Uh, and most of the psychotropic uh, medications are lipid soluble. Then of course there is elimination which may be considered under two headings metabolism and uh, excretion. Metabolism is usually through the liver because almost all the psychotropic agents goes, go through the liver and excretion is uh, mostly through the kidney although psychotropic medications may be expressed in other bodily fluids such as sweat, bile and uh, breast milk. Uh, especially breast milk uh, which can have implications while treating the mother with uh, psychotropic uh, medications and if she happens to be breastfeeding. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So obviously it means that uh, vital organs of elimination such as liver and kidney should be functioning very well because liver is involved in what is known as the first pause metabolism as well wherein the drug passes through the liver is metabolized and the end product may be active or an inactive substance. Renal uh, health is also very important because almost all the psychotropic medications are excreted through the urine. The exception for liver's first pass metabolism is lithium because that exists in the ionic state even in the body when given and uh, therefore it is exchanged uh, unchanged with sodium in the renal system. Therefore, renal health is uh, vitally important if you are planning to give somebody lithium. So that is the exception for liver metabolism. It is not, please remember that lithium is not metabolized in the liver. Then we also have to consider the half-life of uh, any given drug. This is nothing but the time taken for the plasma concentration of the drug to fall by half of the initial level. So this has implications on uh, the frequency of drug use and it can have a deeper implication when giving something like benzodiazepines because shorter the half-life, uh, more frequently the drug would have to be given and therefore the potential for dependence is very high with something like benzodiazepines. So those benzodiazepines which have short half-life can cause drug dependence if used for a very long time. So that is the implication of half-life. Therapeutic index is the ratio of the minimum plasma drug concentration causing toxic effects to that causing therapeutic effect. So basically this means uh, if you give a particular drug, uh, as long as it uh, continues to exert a beneficial effect on the person's mental condition, then it is good. The moment it causes adverse effects, and toxic effects, then that would be an unacceptable situation. So the interval or the concentration of the drug between this therapeutic effect and the toxic effect is what is known as the therapeutic index. Generally, we don't bother about the therapeutic index for individual psychotropic medications because most of them have a wide therapeutic index, except for something like lithium and phenytoin. One has to be very careful while using lithium because it has a very narrow therapeutic index and uh, if it exceeds a certain level then toxicity features may be seen. Moving on to pharmacodynamics which is what the drug does to the body or the effect of the psychotropic medications on the body's tissues and cells. In particular in psychiatry we talk about neurotransmitter modulation that is change in the functioning of certain chemicals especially in the brain called neurotransmitters. So these may be monoamines such as dopamine, 
noradrenaline and serotonin or they could also be amino acids such as gamma amino glutaric acid or GABA and uh, glutamic acid. So the uh, psychotropic agents are uh, divided depending on the neurotransmitters that they act upon. And this is uh, depicted in the picture on the right. The top picture indicates the uh, drug action of psychotropic agents that is in the presynaptic neuron, in the synapse and in the postsynaptic neuron. And numbers there indicate uh, various activities that happen in these levels such as synthesis, storage, release, reuptake, degradation, the receptor actions and what happens in the postsynaptic uh, cell. So at each of these levels which are numbered as you can see, uh, there is an explanation at the bottom which shows the uh, specific drug action that can happen. For example, number one synthesis. L-tryptophan, which is an amino acid, is a precursor of serotonin. Therefore, the administration of tryptophan results in higher serotonin synthesis and therefore increased serotonergic activity. So that is what is shown in uh, number one in the picture above. The second is where the drug is stored in the nerve terminal vesicles, still in the presynaptic uh, neuron. Something like reserpine can cause a depletion of uh, noradrenaline and dopamine stores. So that is a drug example. Thirdly, the drug is released into the synaptic cleft and uh, a drug such as amphetamine can cause a release of noradrenaline and dopamine into the synapse. Reuptake is where the uh, neurotransmitter is taken back into the presynaptic neuron and uh, antidepressants such as tricyclic antidepressants or SSRIs which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors prevent this reuptake from happening so that there is more of serotonergic activity happening where it matters that is in the synapse which leads to the therapeutic effect in conditions such as depression or anxiety. Degradation is where the uh, neurotransmitter is broken down and monoamine oxidase inhibitors which are antidepressants prevent the breakdown of these neurotransmitters therefore increasing their activity. At the receptor level uh, which is usually on the postsynaptic uh, cell membrane the best example is antipsychotics which block the dopaminergic uh, receptors and uh, prevent excess dopaminergic activity. So in that respect the mechanism of action of uh, antidepressants and antipsychotics is different in the sense that antidepressants are pro-serotonergic that means they increase the serotonergic activity and antipsychotics are anti-dopaminergic that is they reduce the dopaminergic activity on the postsynaptic neuron. There could be uh, postsynaptic activity as well such as uh, lithium which may act by inhibiting the second messenger functioning in the postsynaptic neuron. So this is how the uh, various psychotropic uh, medications, at least the main ones, exert their action in the brain. Tolerance uh, can be a problem in uh, psychiatry because uh, basically it is a diminished response to the administration of drug uh, with the repeated exposure. That means if you keep giving the medication or the drug, the therapeutic effect keeps reducing with each successive dose. So this may be seen in benzodiazepine dependence, which is why it is always advisable not to give too much of uh, benzodiazepines or for too long because tolerance may uh, develop and lead to dependence on benzodiazepines. Tolerance uh, is also a feature of alcohol dependence, wherein the person will have to take more and more amount of alcohol to get the same level of satisfaction. There may also be cross tolerance that is tolerance towards one drug may lead to tolerance towards a related drug. Uh, example would be if a person is dependent on alcohol, he or she may require high and very high doses of benzodiazepines or barbiturates to control the withdrawal features of alcohol uh, dependence. 
So that's mainly about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of psychotropic medications. Consent to treatment is important in any field, but it is especially important in psychiatry. And this applies to uh, treatment with medications also. And uh, it is especially applicable to other kinds of treatments in psychiatry, such as electroconvulsive therapy. Basically, consent involves explaining to the patient about the proposed treatment, the nature of the treatment, the duration, the pros and cons of taking the treatment, the adverse effects, the consequences of not taking the treatment, and giving the patient time to consider these aspects before reaching a decision, if necessary, by consulting with family members, and also giving literature pertaining to this uh, treatment so that the person is able to make a better decision, an informed decision, which is finally taken without any coercion or duress uh, and, the, uh, and the person is fully agreeing to take the treatment and continue taking the treatment and he or she should also be aware that they can stop the consent at any time during the course of the treatment. Of course all this applies uh, to those situations where it is uh, uh, where the consent to treatment is intact that is it is not affected by any pre-existing uh, mental illness which may reduce the capacity to make uh, consent and these include examples such as uh, psychosis with uh, loss of insight uh, or life-threatening uh, situations such as very very severe depression with uh, neglect. There uh, there may not be enough time to consider aspects of consent and one may have to undertake uh, emergency treatment but once the patient recovers enough to make his or her own decision then the all the uh, steps of consent will have to be carried out appropriately. So let us now talk about uh, the groups of anti... So let us now talk about the major psychotropic agent groups, their subgroups and uh, specific examples under each of these groups. First of all, let's consider anti-anxiety or hypnotic agents. Hypnotic means those that induce sleep. Under this, the main subgroup is benzodiazepines and uh, under that you have examples such as diazepam, clonazepam, lorazepam, medazolam, alprazolam and chlorodiazepoxide. Diazepam is a long-acting uh, benzodiazepine and it is uh, used widely in uh, different conditions such as anxiety for inducing sleep and to control behavioral disorders. Clonazepam is mainly used as a sleep-inducing agent. Lorazepam is a very good anti-anxiety agent and can be used on a short-term basis. Midazolam is ultra-short-acting and can be used to control behavioral disorders. Alprazolam is also used as a sleep medication. Chlorodiazepoxide is ultra-long-acting benzodiazepine and uh, it's usually used to control the withdrawal effects from uh, alcohol dependence. The so-called uh, Z medications also act on the GABA receptor complex just like uh, benzodiazepines but uh, they differ from benzodiazepines in their pharmacodynamic uh, properties and these include uh, Zopiclone, Zolpidem and Zaleplon and all uh, three of these Z medications are mainly used as hypnotic agents. Let's move on to the next major group which is antidepressants. Under this you have SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, the common example is uh, sertraline and acetylopram, both of which can be used in a wide variety of conditions such as depression and all the anxiety disorders. Fluoxetine uh, in addition to depression is also used in the treatment of eating disorders such as bulimia and obsessive compulsive disorders. Fluoxamine is also used in OCD. Cetylopram is also widely used in different conditions. Peroxetine is used in uh, phobic disorders. Tricyclic antidepressants uh, are the older antidepressants. They are older than SSRIs and the examples include uh, amitriptyline, dothiapine or also called dosilipine, clomipramine, imipramine and lofepramine. Amitriptyline and uh, imipramine can also be used in uh, nocturnal enuresis. Most of these uh, tricyclic antidepressants cause uh, drowsiness 
and also cardiac side effects, which is why SSRIs are generally preferred as first-line antidepressant medications over TCAs. Clomipramine is the only tricyclic antidepressant that is used in the treatment of OCD. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors or MAOIs such as tranylcypromine and phenylzine and metilbamide are used in the treatment of depression mainly. Moclobamide which is a reversible inhibitor uh, is also used in the treatment of phobic conditions. There are other uh, less commonly used groups such as SNRI, serotonin noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor, NARI that is noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor and uh, noradrenergic and specific serotonergic antidepressants such as mirtazapine. Uh, Venlafaxine is an example under this which can be used in depression and generalized uh, anxiety disorder. Duloxetine is used in depression and also for pain modulation. Riboxetine and mirtazapine are used as antidepressants. Please remember that all these uh, groups, SSRIs, TCAs, MAOIs and other groups are primarily antidepressants and all of them can be used as antidepressant medications. But they are also anti-anxiety, at least most of them, because the mechanism of causation of anxiety is similar, that is under activity of the serotonin system. So now let's move on to the other major group, antipsychotics. Traditionally, we divide these into typical and atypical. Typical are those antipsychotics which mainly uh, confine their activity to the dopaminergic uh, receptors. Whereas atypical antipsychotics, in addition to acting on the dopaminergic uh, system, they also act on other receptors such as the serotonin, serotonin system. So the atypicality pertains to the mechanism of action of these uh, medications. Under typical chlorpromazine, which is probably the oldest uh, antipsychotic uh, and is still being used, although very less, haloperidol is another example of typical antipsychotic and it has a wide usage because it's a very versatile drug that can be given in uh, many routes, that is oral, IM, IV and also as a depot medication. It is used both in uh, schizophrenia as well as in acute behavioral disturbances. Pimozide, trifluperazine or the other types of antipsychotics which can be used in any type of uh, psychosis. Flufenazine and flupentixol are mainly used as depot antipsychotic agents in the treatment of schizophrenia. Zuclopentixol has uh, two components. The active component is used in the management of acute behavioral disturbance and the long-acting preparation can be used as a depot antipsychotic. Atypical antipsychotics include risperidone which is used in a wide range of conditions but can cause hyperprolactinemia as a specific side effect. Olanzapine is also used but it can cause weight gain and uh, changes in sugar level. Cotiapine can cause ECG changes and uh, drowsiness but it is still used. Aripiprazole and amisulpride are less used than the other medications. Out of all of these, uh, clozapine is uh, reserved only for treatment resistant types of schizophrenia and that too after the usage of uh, other medications such as a typical or an atypical antipsychotic. And the reason for this is because it causes uh, very serious side effects such as uh, a granulocytosis about which we'll be talking about uh, later. So even though it is a very good antipsychotic, it is less used than the others and it's specifically used for treatment resistant schizophrenia. Then we have mood stabilizers which are used in mood disorders such as the bipolar disorder. Under this the most uh, commonly used and the first line mood stabilizer is lithium. Um, and after this you have anti-epileptics which can also be used as mood stabilizers such as semi-sodium valproate which is an isomer of uh, sodium valproate, carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine and lamotrigine. Let's now move on to anti-dementia drugs. These mainly exert their action by uh, increasing the cholinergic activity. So therefore they reduce the activity of the enzyme which metabolizes so uh, examples include donepezil, rivastigmine and galantamine. Donepezil is the first line anti-dementia medication and it can be used in uh, milder and moderate forms of uh, dementia. Glutamate or NNDA antagonist is uh, memantine which is used in uh, severe cases of 
dementia. For abstinence therapy for alcohol dependence, you have uh, medications such as acamprosate, baclofen, and uh, disulfiran. Remember that uh, along with SSRIs and naltrexone, acamprosate and baclofen are used to reduce the craving for taking uh, alcohol. Whereas disulfiram is an anti-abuse medication, that is, if taken along with alcohol, it can cause a severe life-threatening reaction. So therefore, it is used as an aversive therapy in alcohol dependence. For smoking cessation, anti-craving agents can be used, and these are bupropion and uh, varenicline. There are other drugs used in uh, opiate uh, dependence, such as naltrexone, methadone, and buprenorphine. In ADHD, that is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, stimulant medications or amphetamine derivatives such as methylphenidate and dexamphetamine are the first line medications and they are generally very effective in controlling the disruptive behavior. Other non-stimulant medications such as atomoxetin, clonidine and guanfishine can also be used. Atomoxetin is especially used in uh, adolescents and uh, adults. Clonidine can cause blood pressure changes, so that needs to be monitored. Whereas guanfishine is used in ADHD along with Tourette syndrome because it is quite effective in the treatment of tic disorders. So uh, if we talk about the specific indications of each of these uh, psychotropic groups, then you will find that antidepressants are used uh, primarily in depression but also in anxiety disorders. And uh, enuresis, especially amitriptyline and imipramine, are used in enuresis. Antipsychotics, primarily used in schizophrenia, but can also be used in other forms of uh, psychosis, which are not schizophrenia, such as delusional disorder, or behavioral disorders, and uh, violence, or any acute behavioral disturbance. Benzodiazepines are used to reduce anxiety and uh, in the short-term treatment of uh, insomnia and also in uh, behavioral disorders and violence. Mood stabilizers are uh, used in the treatment of mania such as uh, lithium or semisodium valproate and in the profile axis of bipolar uh, affective disorder to keep the mood stable. They can also be used in behavioral uh, disorders especially in uh, children or those with uh, mental retardation or sometimes even in the elderly. And of course, uh, except lithium, all the other mood stabilizers are anti-epileptics. Stimulants such as uh, amphetamine derivatives are used in the treatment of ADHD and also narcolepsy, which is a sleep disorder characterized by hypersomnia and uh, cataplexy. Electroconvulsive therapy, about which we'll be talking about in uh, detail later on, is used in the treatment of severe depression, dangerous uh, suicidal ideas or tendencies, Severe self-neglect, that is not eating uh, or drinking and uh, not attending to personal hygiene. And also in treatment resistant cases of schizophrenia. So I've included uh, this slide just to give you an idea about uh, what we mean by recovery uh, during treatment with any of these psychotropic uh, medications and also the nature of uh, prognosis in uh, the treatment of psychiatric disorders. I have taken the example of depression. So under this, uh, response would indicate significant reduction in depressive symptoms or no symptoms at all uh, for about two weeks after starting the antidepressant medication. Whereas remission means no or few symptoms uh, beyond two weeks, that is up to two months. So you might have to wait for up to two months in the treatment of depression to see if the medication that you are using is working well or not. Recovery would indicate that uh, there are no symptoms uh, beyond two months. That means the patient has basically recovered from that particular depressive episode. Whereas relapse indicates the depressive symptoms are coming back during the period of remission, that is under two months of treatment. If the patient's condition worsens once again in terms of his mood, that means that the psychotropic or the antidepressant medication that you are using may not be effective and you might have to change over to something else. On the other hand, recurrence means uh, the depressive symptoms come back once again 
after a period of recovery that is if the patient has already recovered from a depressive episode then uh, if the uh, low mood comes back again as bad as the previous episode that means it is a recurrence of another episode of depression so in the case of relapse it is still considered to be part of the same episode of depression but it just shows that you might have to augment the dose of the antidepressant that you are using or switch over to another antidepressant whereas in the case of uh, recurrence uh, then the condition may be called recurrent depressive disorder and once again you might have to augment the antidepressant therapy or give the treatment for longer periods of time so that the recovery period is increased so now let's uh, move on to the adverse effects of uh, the each of these medication groups uh, benzodiazepines and z medications obviously they cause uh, drowsiness which may carry over to the next day after taking them in the night time so there may be something like hangover effects and also as i said uh, before uh, remember that the shorter the half life more the dependence potential so in general it's better to remember that uh, all of these uh, benzodiazepines and z medications are potentially dependence causing medications therefore their use has to be limited and for a short duration only also remember that in the elderly age group uh, benzodiazepines can cause a paradoxical aggression that means they can cause the very condition that you are trying to control in the elderly so please bear that in mind moving on to antidepressants among ssris siadh that is syndrome of inappropriate adh secretion is uh, problematic and can lead to the dangerous hyponatremia and uh, therefore corrective measures have to be taken and probably a changing over to um, a medication of a different class or group has to be considered lowering of seizure threshold is a common problem to all antidepressants and antipsychotics and uh, therefore you have to keep this in mind if somebody with epilepsy is depressed or has psychosis then the usage of these medications may have to be restricted sexual dysfunction again is quite common uh, you know, among all ssris and can range from loss of libido to anorgasmia to delayed ejaculation so that again uh, has to be considered when you are undertaking long term treatment with ssris tricyclic antidepressants as i told you are older than ssris and uh, cause quite a few side effects but i have only shown three here uh, drowsiness is common to many of them especially amitriptyline and uh, ecg changes can occur uh, especially to do with qrs and qtc uh, intervals and even p waves so you have to consider that if you are using tricyclic antidepressants in somebody with a prior cardiac history lowering of seizure threshold as i have explained can also be seen with tricyclic antidepressants monoamine oxidase inhibitors in specific cause something called cheese reaction basically uh, this is a reaction uh, to uh, any food stuff substance that contains tyramine in it this can be potentially fatal so um, prior intimation and explanation of the kind of food stuff substances to be avoided while taking maois has to be given to the patient among children in adhd uh, stimulants can cause blood pressure changes and full blood count uh, changes so you have to monitor uh, pulse bp and full blood count also they are known to cause growth retardation in uh, specific uh, reduction in the height so height and weight monitoring should also be done if you are treating a child with adhd with uh, stimulants such as methylphenidate or dexamphetamine moving on to antipsychotics among the typical antipsychotics ecg changes can happen especially prolonged qtc interval which can be potentially fatal and can lead to sudden cardiac death you have to know the qtc intervals for men and uh, women lowering of uh, seizure threshold can also happen 
extra pyramidal side effects also commonly happen and uh, we will talk about that a little bit later. Atypical antipsychotics also cause ECG changes, lowering of seizure threshold and uh, EPSCs. In addition, uh, they also cause a metabolic uh, syndrome that is weight gain, increase in uh, bidam circumference, waist circumference, increase in the body mass index, high sugar levels, high cholesterol level, uh, raised uh, BP. All these things are part of metabolic syndrome and uh, especially antipsychotics such as olanzapine and clozapine can cause a lot of this uh, because they can cause increase in appetite leading to weight gain and uh, worsening of the diabetic status. Clozapine can cause potentially life-threatening leukopenia and uh, agranulocytosis so the blood monitoring has to be done very very closely during treatment with uh, closer pain and like I mentioned before risperidone can cause high prolactin levels leading to painful breast engorgement in uh, women and uh, infertility in both the genders. Among mood stabilizers lithium is important because uh, it can cause a host of uh, side effects commonly weight gain and uh, fine tremors it can also cause uh, hypothyroidism and uh, as I said before because it's excreted exclusively in the kidney it can cause renal toxicity. During pregnancy it can lead to teratogenic uh, changes especially to do with the cardiac formation in the developing fetus and uh, specifically it is known to cause Epstein's anomaly. Sodium valproate and carbamazepine can cause weight gain and uh, hair loss. Uh, and since they are extensively metabolized in the liver, they can lead to hepatotoxicity as well. They are also known to be teratogenic during pregnancy and can lead to open neural tube defects such as spina bifida and uh, orofacial malformations. So let's now turn our attention to specific side effects uh, which are important when you are talking about that particular psychotropic uh, group. So the antipsychotics can cause extrapyramidal side effects because they are anti-dopaminergic in their action. Therefore, they can lead to uh, dopamine underactivity. Therefore, they can cause uh, Parkinson-like uh, symptoms. So the extrapyramidal side effects, uh, I have arranged these in the order of their appearance when you give a particular antipsychotic medication. For example, acute dystonia can occur within minutes to hours of uh, taking antipsychotic medication, especially if it is given in the parenteral route. Parkinsonism can take uh, days to weeks to appear. So also akathisia, a uh, few days to weeks to appear. And tardive dyskinesia is usually the last to appear and it takes uh, several months to years before it manifests. So in acute dystonia, uh, there is uh, sudden rigidity in the uh, head and neck uh, area. So this may be characterized by torticollis or oculogyric crisis or opisthotonus and uh, a general inability to speak or swallow. Even though this is not life-threatening, it can be very distressing to the patient and uh, it can be relieved by giving parenteral anticholinergic uh, agents such as procycliding. Parkinsonism uh, is nothing but uh, the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease such as rigidity and uh, tremors and slowed movement and thinking and once again the dose of the antipsychotic would have to be reduced in this case and an anticholinergic uh, agent may be added such as trihexyphenidyl. Akathisia uh, is characterized by subjective motor restlessness that means the patient is unable to sit still and is very fidgety, rocking from one foot to another and moving up and down the room. Anticholinergics are generally not very helpful in this condition. Uh, instead, uh, one has to reduce the dose of the antipsychotic or change over to uh, another antipsychotic from a different group. Propranolol uh, can be used, ciproheptidine can also be used along with a short course of uh, benzodiazepines to control the signs and symptoms of akathisia. Tardive dyskinesia is the last to come and is characterized by 
buccal movements uh, such as movements of the lips and the mouth initially later on it can lead to coriform movements in the hands and also involve trunk in the late stages in which case it can be extremely distressing because the movements can be quite severe and restrict the lifestyle of the patient unfortunately it's a very difficult condition to treat especially in the late stages anticholinergics would have to be stopped if the patient is taking them tetrabenazine is also indicated in the treatment of tardive dyskinesia and along with uh, vitamin E and uh, benzodiazepines although benzodiazepines cannot be given on a long term basis tetrabenazine and vitamin E can be considered on a long term basis atypical antipsychotics would have to be considered especially something like uh, clozapine even ECT may be an uh, alternative to medication as i already mentioned before risperidone can cause hyperprolactinemia and the consequences of that condition moving on to neuroleptic malignant syndrome this can occur when an antipsychotic naive patient receives uh, antipsychotic medication especially in the high dose or by the parenteral route it is characterized by fever sweating extreme muscular rigidity uh, maybe even in the form of lead pipe rigidity confusion changes in consciousness fluctuating blood pressure and uh, tachycardia lab tests may show elevated cpk that is creatine phosphokinase levels and uh, high white cell count along with uh, altered liver function tests so this is a, a psychiatric emergency and is uh, potentially fatal therefore it has to be managed in an icu the incriminating uh, drug that is the antipsychotic medication has to be immediately stopped rehydration has to be undertaken bromocriptine and uh, dantrolene can be given to reverse the effects of the antipsychotic medication benzodiazepines can also be used ventilation and cooling blankets are also considered because of the presence of hyperthermia later on when the antipsychotics are restarted a totally different antipsychotic from a new group should be started uh, clozapine may be considered and even ect may be a better alternative to giving antipsychotic uh, medications generally after recovery from uh, nms up to 2 weeks no antipsychotics should be given and when restarted it should be at a very very low dose taking all the precautions that i just mentioned Serotonin syndrome is very similar to NMS but the reason why it occurs is due to excess serotonin activity usually this is a result of combining two or more antidepressant medications maybe even across groups such as combining an SSRI with a TCA and so on the symptoms of serotonin syndrome are very similar to NMS except that uh, muscular rigidity is less and uh, serotonin syndrome is more characterized by myoclonic jerks and uh, hyperreflexia this is also potentially fatal therefore the antidepressant medication would have to be discontinued and uh, restarted at a very very small dose if at all and alternatives to antidepressant uh, medication such as psychotherapy should be considered ssri discontinuation syndrome or withdrawal syndrome from ssris happens if the patient abruptly stops the ssri medication it has to be tapered off gradually when uh, the patient uh, recovers from a period of uh, depression but sometimes patients can stop them abruptly and uh, it can result in uncomfortable symptoms such as restlessness sensory abnormalities dizziness and uh, insomnia this is not uh, life threatening but it can be very distressing for the patient metabolic syndrome as we discussed is characterized by weight gain and uh, high bmi high blood sugar levels high cholesterol level and uh, hypertension and uh, is particularly common with uh, antipsychotic medications such as olanzapine and uh, clozapine as we discussed the lithium has a very narrow therapeutic index of 0.6 to 1.2 milli equivalents per liter if it goes beyond 1.5 milli equivalents per liter then the signs of toxicity can occur such as coarse tremors drowsiness 
and uh, in extreme cases if it goes above 2 milli equivalents per liter it can uh, result in uh, altered consciousness, seizures, coma and death. You will have to stop the lithium as soon as you suspect toxicity and monitor the renal functions and may even refer the patient for hemodialysis in extreme cases. Now let's consider some special patient groups and the pharmacological issues in that group and the clinical applications that we may have to come up with based on those issues. In children there can be higher peak plasma concentration so they, therefore you cannot give a very big dose straight away. Uh, the drug may have shorter half-life in children and uh, faster elimination. This means that a small dose may have to be given more frequently in children. So lower doses and more frequent doses and of course as I mentioned before with ADHD treatment monitor the growth and vital parameters in general for all psychotropic medications that are used in children. In the elderly there are other issues that is it may be uneven distribution of the drug and uh, there may be lower renal elimination because of uh, renal issues and because the elderly are likely to have other conditions and uh, treatment for those conditions the drug-drug interaction may be uh, very frequent and problematic in the elderly. There may also be the additional problem of enzyme inhibition leading to drug accumulation in the body and therefore the possibility of adverse effects. So the mantra for uh, elderly age group is to go low and slow that means start at a very low dose and uh, increase the dose if at all very gradually. Keep checking for interactions with other medications and monitor the vital parameters. It is also better to do regular checkups of liver and renal function and also cardiac function and also ECG to rule out the possibility of prolonged QTC intervals. During pregnancy the first trimester is considered to be the most sensitive period because organogenesis is taking place in the fetus during this period. Therefore anything that uh, crosses the placental barrier may have an adverse effect on the fetus. There may even be teratogenic effects like we have discussed with mood stabilizers. So it's better to avoid if at all possible all uh, psychotropic agents during the first uh, trimester of pregnancy and uh, even during the second and third trimester it is better to uh, give a very small dose if it is really required. Generally older psychotropic agents are preferred over newer ones because the safety data is uh, more available with the older medications. So therefore uh, um, among antidepressants tricyclic antidepressants may have to be given and among uh, antipsychotics typical antipsychotic agents may have to be used during pregnancy. If at all uh, possible, uh, consider alternatives to using medications such as uh, psychotherapy and it's better to avoid lithium and clozapine altogether during pregnancy. The issues are somewhat similar even during uh, breastfeeding that is that uh, almost all the psychotropic agents are expressed in the breast milk. Therefore, uh, fetal exposure through breast milk is possible. However, one cannot stop the breastfeeding completely because breastfeeding is uh, recommended for neonatal health because it is filled with uh, immunity promoting factors. And also uh, as far as psychiatry is concerned, breastfeeding is very good for mother-child bonding. Therefore, one cannot advise the mother to stop breastfeeding just because uh, she is on psychotropic agents. Again here, older psychotropic agents have to be uh, given. Avoid uh, sedating medications as far as possible because that can again reach the baby and cause uh, excessive sedation. Monitoring uh, maternal mental health very, is very vital uh, if you are giving uh, psychotropic agents so that if the condition improves, the dose can be reduced or the drug can be totally stopped. Neonatal health should also be monitored during therapy and uh, like with pregnancy if at all possible consider stopping the uh, psychotropic agent and going for psychotherapy especially if it happens to be a milder condition that can be managed without medications. 
Generally speaking, in all these special groups, one has to remember that it is all about weighing the risks and benefits. If the risk is uh, very high and uh, the benefit from giving the psychotropic agent is low, then it's probably best that we do not give the psychotropic agent. On the other hand, if the risk is low and uh, the benefits of giving the medication is high, then in that case, psychotropic agent may have to be given with due precautions. So one has to consider which is more dangerous. For example, during pregnancy, allowing the lady to be without medication is more dangerous or giving the medication is uh, more dangerous due to the side effects and uh, teratogenicity. This has to be considered in every patient group before you undertake treatment. Electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. Electroconvulsive therapy involves the passage of mild electric current uh, through the brain so that seizure is induced. The exact mechanism of uh, action of uh, ECT is not known but it is known to have an enhanced antidepressive effect. ECT has received a lot of uh, bad press over the years due to all the negative portrayal of uh, ECT as some kind of punitive measure. Whereas in actual fact, if done properly, it can be a life-saving treatment. Most of the uh, bad impression about ECT occurred because of the use of unmodified ECT, that is ECT done without giving any anesthesia or muscle relaxation, which resulted in uh, severe seizures leading to injuries and uh, fractures. Whereas in modern psychiatry, what we use is modified ECT, uh, which is done under very controlled conditions in the OT, or at least in a room that is equipped with uh, emergency crash trolleys. The presence of an anesthetist is required to give anesthesia and muscle relaxation. And only after all these are done, mild electricity is passed through electrodes that are placed on the scalp of the patient. So accordingly, ECT may be unilateral or bilateral. In unilateral ECT, the electrodes are placed on same side of the head, usually uh, on the non-dominant uh, side. In bilateral ECT, uh, electrodes are placed bitemporally, uh, one inch above the midpoint joining the outer canthus of the eye to the tragus of the ear. Each of these methods has its own advantage and disadvantage. Unilateral uh, ECT which is done by placing electrodes on the frontal area or on the parietal area only uh, it can cause less side effects but is also less effective in treating the underlying condition. Whereas bilateral uh, ECT is very effective in treating the condition but it can cause more side effects. EEG monitoring is the best way to make sure that seizures are occurring after passing the electricity. If this is not available, then limb isolation by occluding the arterial supply to one particular leg or arm should be done so that uh, when the electricity is passed, you can observe the clinical seizures in that particular limb. There may be several sessions of uh, ECT and there may be up to two or three sessions of ECT in a week and a course of ECT may have 8 to 12 sessions of ECT depending on the severity of the condition that is being treated. We have already talked about the indications for uh, ECT which is uh, very severe depression, severe self-neglect or suicidal tendencies and uh, treatment resistant schizophrenia. Side effects, the common one is a headache which is uh, limiting and uh, there can also be cognitive side effects especially short term memory loss which is said to be reversible and uh, usually recovers after the ECT course is finished. What about the contraindications? Please remember that there are no absolute contraindications to ECT. There are only relative contraindications and these may include uh, first trimester of pregnancy, raised intracranial tension, recent stroke or heart attack, uh, acute glaucoma, retinal detachment or unstable fractures. So please remember that uh, ECT can be a life-saving treatment in severe depression or schizophrenia.
So now let's uh, move on to the other aspect of uh, management in uh, psychiatry that is psychotherapy or psychological treatment. Uh, under this uh, counseling and psychotherapy are some of the loosely used terminologies but there are certain common features to all psychotherapeutic interventions and these are intense confiding relationship that means it is uh, a very can be a very intense relationship between the patient and the therapist and it has to take place in a healing setting with the full confidence uh, from the patient side that the therapist will be able to maintain professionalism and confidentiality throughout and uh, it is founded on the rationales of uh, therapy and it involves a therapeutic procedure that means it is an intervention with the aim of alleviating the distress in the patient so what are the good attributes of a therapist there should be accurate uh, empathy that means uh, empathy should be shown at the right amount and at the right time for the right cause and the patient uh, should be positively regarded that means uh, there should not be any judgment on part of the therapist and the regard should always be that uh, the condition will get better as the therapy progresses that is a confidence that should be instilled in the mind of the patient and of course a good patient therapist relationship and rapport is very very important empathy is extremely important during uh, any kind of psychotherapy because it is several notches above sympathy sympathy is just uh, ex expressing your solidarity towards the patient and telling uh, how sorry you are for his or her predicament whereas empathy is actually putting yourself in the patient's position and trying to understand uh, what emotional and behavioral changes occurred in the patient due to the patient's condition. So what are the counseling skills? Setting the scene that means uh, you should not carry out psychotherapy in a very casual manner uh, in a corridor for example it has to be in a private setting you have to introduce the uh, need for psychotherapy to the patient take him or her in uh, confidence uh, keep a glass of water or a box of tissues ready just in case uh, things can become very emotional so all this is part of uh, setting the scene the next uh, requirement is to listen very well because sometimes patients come to vent out that means they come there to tell their problem to somebody because often in their personal lives they are unable to communicate the deep personal problem with anybody so just by listening well sometimes there can be a very good therapeutic effect for the patient an empathetic approach as we have discussed is uh, extremely important it should also be non-judgmental that is uh, not blaming the patient for his or her problem and instead trying to help the patient to find solutions on his or her own Support and guidance is to be given only if absolutely necessary because the overarching aim of any psychotherapeutic intervention is to encourage independence and resilience. That means the patient should be able to find solution on his or her own to his or her problems and uh, not keep coming back to the therapist again and again over trivial issues. Instead, the patient should be able to move on from the issue, deal with the issue, face the issue, learn lessons from the issue and incorporate those lessons going forward so that he or she does not get into such a mental state once again. So that is what we mean by increasing independence and resilience. We will now move on to individual types of uh, psychotherapies. Uh, so supportive psychotherapy is a general and it is non-goal directed as opposed to something like CBT or uh, psychodynamic uh, therapies which we will be talking about later. And it can be done by mental health professionals or even physical health professionals in all settings. So what are the indications for psych supportive psychotherapy? Ongoing stress due to any mental or physical illness, following trauma of any kind, and to improve adjustment to the person's condition or trauma. So the key elements of supportive psychotherapy are careful listening uh, leading to ventilation on part of the patient where he or she is comfortable enough to 
air their thoughts and uh, emotions to the therapist. Explanation and education were required uh, because the patient may be unaware of uh, the emotional state he or she may be having. So explaining that may be a part of uh, this type of psychotherapy. Appropriate reassurance has to be given if the problem is not very severe. And guidance and support, as we discussed earlier, can also be given, which is why it is called supportive psychotherapy. Moving on to more specific types of uh, psychotherapies, in particular behavioral therapy. And these are based on the learning theory in uh, psychology. That means the role of the external stimuli and cues on uh, human behavior. In particular, B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning is used in the most of these kind of therapies wherein uh, a particular behavior can be repeated by giving positive stimuli such as rewards and the behavior can be reinforced. On the other hand, uh, behavior can be extinguished by giving uh, negative stimuli or punishments. So this is the theory behind behavioral therapies and uh, they all use the ABC approach that means antecedent behavior and uh, consequences. That means antecedent is the prior event that uh, triggers the behavior in the patient and how the patient felt because of that uh, behavior constitutes the consequence of that behavior. And this is a more uh, specialized type of therapy and uh, therefore it has to be done by specialists who are trained in behavioral therapy such as psychologists and psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses if they are trained in behavioral therapy. So the indications for behavioral therapy are anxiety disorders such as phobias, panic attacks or OCD, lack of motivation and uh, repeated deliberate self-harm behavior. Moving on to a particular type of uh, behavioral therapy called cognitive behavior therapy. It was devised by Aaron Beck in uh, the 1960s and it is brief and problem focused. That means it's, it only focuses on the problem that the patient is having. And it is brief, usually lasting uh, eight to 12 sessions. It uh, undertakes a very collaborative approach. That means the patient and the therapist have to work very closely with each other. It may involve homework in the form of uh, maintaining diaries and uh, uh, recording the ABCs, that is the antecedent behavior and the consequence. And uh, also recording the patient's thoughts and uh, behaviors which can be discussed in the next uh, session with the therapist. The indications for CBT are depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, milder forms of psychosis, personality disorders and even in physical conditions such as chronic pain and cancer. So briefly what happens during a, a session of CBT? It looks at the five elements basically that is cognitions or the thinking aspect of the patient's persona, his or her behavior, the bodily changes such as the uh, palpitations or tremors that may happen during anxiety, the emotional state of the patient during anxiety such as fear or sadness during uh, depression and the role of the environment that is the family, the outside world and the society on the patient's thoughts and behavior. Cognition itself is considered under three levels. So the first is obviously the consciousness, that is what the patient is telling the therapist. And uh, secondly, it may be negative automatic thoughts or those thoughts which happen without the patient's knowledge and are usually negative in their nature, such as I am always messing up uh, things and uh, I don't have much of a future, uh, both of which may be seen in uh, depression or something bad is going to happen which may be a feature of anxiety, especially panic attacks. Maladaptive schema is the third level of cognition that is considered. In other words, core belief that the patient has about him or herself. And these may be uh, things such as, I must be perfect to be accepted, which is uh, unrealistic and may indicate anxiety. I am unlovable, which may be uh, part of a depressive thought process. I must always be in control, which may indicate perfectionist traits or may be part of the underlying anxiety disorder. So all these are considered in CBT and uh, in collaboration with the patient, these are addressed 
and the thoughts and the behavior of the patient are modified so that the effects of these conditions are reduced. Moving on to a highly specialized type of uh, psychotherapy called psychodynamic psychotherapy. The pioneer of this uh, technique was Sigmund Freud and later on uh, Carl Jung and Melanie Klein among others. Here uh, it is indicated in uh, neurotic symptoms and uh, milder personality issues. It is definitely not to be done in psychosis or very severe personality issues. It is more elaborate than uh, CBT and uh, it can go on for one hour during each session and these sessions may go up to three years depending on the nature of the condition. So the key features of uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy are a very good therapeutic relationship between the therapist and the patient, trust and acceptance of the patient and his or her problems. The therapist will have to analyze the links between the current and past life events. Therefore, all the traumatic events that might have occurred in the patient's life will surface during this therapy and it can be quite uncomfortable for the patient. There may also be analysis of dreams because psychodynamically dreams are considered to be uh, wish fulfillment desires or symbolic of something that is happening in the patient's life. So therefore these have to be analyzed and also analysis of defense mechanisms. These are uh, unconscious mechanisms which every one of us uses uh, on a daily basis. The function of this is to reduce distress and to help us function normally. Uh, an example could be denial. Suppose the uh, pain of trauma could, can be so intense that the patient denies having that uh, trauma. This is just one example. There are several other type of uh, defense mechanisms and if these are used in a very unhealthy manner, it can result in neurotic symptoms. So these have to be analyzed as well. So all of this indicates that uh, the therapy can be very intense, long lasting and very uncomfortable issues may crop up during therapy. Therefore, the patient has to be psychologically minded and uh, should be able to bear all those things that come up during therapy. Therefore, patient selection is very important for psychodynamic psychotherapy. There are other types of uh, psychotherapy such as group therapies uh, which may be alcohol uh, dependence group or uh, anxiety groups where, which may be led by a particular uh, group therapist and there may be interaction between the individual members of the group. Marital and couple therapy is done if there are relationship issues between partners or spouses. Family therapy is indicated if uh, there are relationship issues within the family involving parents and siblings. Interpersonal therapy is done if there are issues uh, in dealing with uh, other individuals such as friends and colleagues. Crisis intervention is done if a patient with known mental illness ends up in a crisis and uh, there are dedicated teams which can go out and try to solve the patient's problem. Progressive muscular relaxation is uh, done for anxiety disorders and it involves progressively contracting and relaxing muscle groups because the theory is that uh, uh, if the mind is tense, the body can also be tense. Therefore, by relaxing the body, the mental tension can also be reduced. And like I mentioned in the management table initially, uh, one can add spiritual aspects to the biopsychosocial table and uh, holistic healing therapies would come under this heading and these may include techniques such as uh, Reiki or Pranic healing, yoga and meditation. These may be indicated in the milder forms of anxiety or depression or neurotic conditions and not for more severe conditions or psychotic conditions. So this in nutshell is the entire management of psychiatric uh, conditions. I have only briefly touched upon psychopharmacology, ECT and uh, psychotherapies. I have focused only on the important aspects that are required to be known during the undergraduate medical course. Thank you.